Good morning. My talk today is taken from John chapter 8, verses 1 through 11, and I've entitled it Second Chances. <clears throat> Our account today actually starts back at the beginning of chapter 7, and we find Jesus in Galilee going about his ministry. And the Feast of Tabernacles, that great feast at the end of the harvest, great celebration is about to happen. And Jesus' disciples are encouraging him to go up to Jerusalem to raise his profile. And in chapter 7, verse 5, we read that even his brothers didn't believe who he actually was. But he's still seeking God as to whether this is the right time to go or not. And so he sends his disciples on ahead and he waits. We can speculate that he waits to hear from God his Father that the time is right. And then our account moves forward to the actual feast. And the crowds are there gathered in Jerusalem. We can imagine that the streets would have been packed. The temple courts would have been buzzing with crowds and crowds of people. And throughout the crowd, there's this anticipation. Is Jesus going to come? Are we going to see him undertaking these amazing miracles that he's been doing? And they're excited. There's a huge buzz in the crowd about Jesus. So much so that those who don't believe in Jesus are afraid to say anything against him because public opinion is so much in his favour. And then, partway through the great feast of tabernacles, Jesus appears. And he's in the temple courts, teaching the people. Some people are saying, this is the Christ, this is the Messiah. And others are unsure. Others are even firmly against that view. So we can imagine this debate going on amongst the crowd. Those who believe in him and those who believe he's a charlatan or worse. And we could imagine Jesus sitting in the temple courts, perhaps in amongst the colonnades there in the shadow, with a bright sunshine in the temple court, crowds gathering around him. And the, the Pharisees and the chief priests send the temple guard to arrest him. But the temple guards come back empty handed. And when they're questioned, we see in chapter 7, verse 46, their reply is, no man ever spoke the way that this man speaks. And so the chief priests and the Pharisees wait. They bide their time. And then at the end of chapter 7, we hear that the Feast of Tabernacles comes to an end and that every man went to his home. But some are left. And Jesus is there again in the temple courts 
still teaching the people. But the Pharisees and the chief priests, they've just been waiting their time to have moved against Jesus before the end of the feast, while there's still so many people around, could possibly have created a riot. And so they've been biding their time. And then what appears to them to be a perfect opportunity arises. A man and a woman are caught in the very act of adultery. And so whilst Jesus is there teaching in the temple courts, the Pharisees and the experts in the Old Testament law bring this woman. They push through the crowd with this woman and they stand this woman in the temple courts right in front of Jesus. And they ask Jesus what should be done because the God's law in the Old Testament, as recorded by Moses in Leviticus 20.10 and in Deuteronomy 22.22, says that both the man and the woman in this situation should be put to death. So the crowd are there. Hundreds, perhaps, of people gathered around, straining to hear, straining to see what's happening. And there's this woman standing, you can imagine, with head bowed, frightened, alone, in front of this huge crowd, afraid for her life and afraid of stoning to death as the most, as a really, really horrible way to die. And we can imagine that a hush descends on the crowd. What does Jesus do? He hunkers down and he starts to draw in the dust. And the chief priests and the specialists in the law continue to push him for an answer. The tension builds. The crowd in hushed tones talking amongst themselves. What's he saying? What's he doing? The ones at the back wouldn't be able to see what was happening. But Jesus waits. And then slowly he draws himself up. And he stands before them. And says to them, let he who is without sin cast the first stone. Then he hunkers back down, continues to draw in the dust. And we can imagine time passing by whilst the crowd slowly, one by one, starts to dissipate. Jesus had set his challenge. He'd made his play. He'd refused to play the game the way the chief priests, and the Pharisees and the experts in the law had tried to set the game in play. He'd refused to play according to their rules. And now he let the Holy Spirit go to work. Slowly, slowly, the crowd disappears until in the silence of the temple courts, in the shadow of the colonnade, Jesus 
rises. It must have seemed like an absolute eternity for that woman. And at last he speaks to her. And he says, has anyone condemned you? And she replies, no, sir, not. And he then says, then neither do I. Go and sin no more. And we can imagine her, perhaps head still bowed, walking out of the temple courts, walking out to a new life. Jesus had recognised her sin, but he'd also given her second chance. We can imagine the heavenly hosts, that great celebration that evil intent had been vanquished and a soul had been saved for eternity. How often do we suddenly find situations turning nasty? That abusive partner who's about to flip. That work colleague who's just about to turn really nasty. That night out in the pub when the atmosphere starts to change. And we know something's about to kick off. Can we have that presence of mind? Can we have that closeness to our Father God that in those situations we are able to create the space, we are able to draw in the sand, to do something that buys us that time. A good friend of mine reminded me that elite sportsmen, elite sportsmen and women practice for hours and hours to make sure that what they're doing is second nature. I was also reminded of my driving test, practicing the emergency stop over and over again until it was instinctive. It was second nature. And it's those hours spent practicing that mean that when the big match comes, what those sportsmen and women do is instinctive. And it wins the match. What we do when a child runs out into the road is instinctive and saves a life. It takes time and dedication to get to that point where our relationship with God the Father is such. And our relationship with the Holy Spirit is such that when the difficult times come, we're able to act instinctively. We're able to do the right thing without having to be consciously doing it. To allow the Father's will to prevail and to allow the Holy Spirit to do what only he can do, to speak through us, to act through us, and to impact the hearts of others.
And that's particularly difficult in these challenging situations when our human nature is to either flight or to fight. When we have that relationship with God the Father and we have that relationship through Jesus with the Holy Spirit, we have a third option and that's to allow them to work on our behalf. So my prayer today is that we won't be those people who take it upon ourselves to judge. We will be the people who bring wise counsel, but we bring it with the right heart. We bring wise counsel in a careful, considered way. And that we're a people who are ready to give others a second chance. That our first instinct in a crisis will be to seek God. That we will be able to write in the dust and allow the Holy Spirit to lead and guide us so that the Father's will can be done and not ours. So, Lord Jesus, I pray for us all that we would be those who are so in tune with you that we allow you, Holy Spirit, to lead and to guide us, that we would be about the Father's will, that we would be about the Father's will in a way which blesses those around us and honours you and is true to your word. That we will be those who give others a second chance. And I thank you, Lord, from the bottom of my heart that you've given me so many second chances. that I can be here today giving testimony to your goodness, to your mercy, to your grace, not because of anything that I have done, but out of your love and your care and your grace. Thank you, Lord. Well, that's come to the end of my session for today. If it's raised any questions in your mind, if there's anything else that you'd like to perhaps kick around, anything you'd like to discuss or get further clarification on, then I'd love to talk to you. And uh, the details will come up on the screen very, very shortly. See you soon. Bye for now.